everyone that's here. It's um, eight o'clock and my name is Mary Giannotti. I'm a physical therapist and I'm a professor um, at the University of Hartford. I also am the co-chair of the adult study group and um, one of the investigators for the adult study uh, that's part of the CP research network. And tonight on Wednesday nights, we have our um, CP sem uh, webinar series. And tonight I'm really super excited because um, we're gonna hear from doc Dr. Julie Stutzbach, who's also a PT and a PhD researcher. So um, I'm gonna have a few minutes where I'm gonna just talk about the network. For those of you who maybe do not know about it, um, this is for your information. And for those of you who have been to those webinars, um, hopefully this will be um, informative, but it might be repetitive. Okay, let's see if I can progress the slide. We can do it. So first I'll do an introduction to the CP Research Network. Then um, Dr. Studzbach will give us a presentation of her um, project that she's proposing and moving forward and has approval for through the CP Research Network. And then really what we're here for is to get some feedback and some questions and answers from people in the community. And before we start, just to see who is here today, we have a poll. So for those of you who can, if you're not driving or, or rolling, if you have the capacity to um, give us an indication, I launched the poll. Let me know, can you see, there should be four questions. One is which of the following best describes you? And is this your first um, MyCP webinar? And are you already a member of MyCP? And if you're already a member, um, have you, you, you know, what services have you used? Great, and I see some people are participating have about 10 responses. So I'll just wait a few more minutes. I know there's 25 people and I know probably not everybody can answer the poll or will, but we'll just give people another minute or two because we like to know if we're meeting, reaching new people or, you know, because we tried different ways to um, reach out to people on different um, social media outlets and through different agencies. Um, or how many repeat offenders we have. And of course we love repeat offenders. All right. Oh, I still see um, the poll is still moving. I have 17 people. So I'll just wait one more minute. And it looks like we have mostly adults with CP and we have, a, have almost half of the people it's their first webinar. And um, some people are already part of my CP and people have done the surveys. Thank you very much. The forum recommendations and notification customization and fitness for people have done fitness. Great. Yeah. All right. So I could share the results. I kind of read through them. So I'm just going to progress along. Well, welcome to everyone who's new. The mission of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network is optimizing the lifelong health and wellness of people with cerebral palsy and their families through high quality research, education, and community program. And my story is, is I got involved with the Cerebral Palsy Research Network because as a physical therapist, I was involved in lots of long-term outcome studies, um, looking at the efficacy of interventions to orthopedic interventions that were done at Shriners. And I saw that adults were having issues that superseded, you know, the concerns about gait impairments, um, issues with health and well-being, and issues <laughs> with employment and um, social integration. So really excited to be part of this network and push forth the agenda of, of um, getting some more information about adults with cerebral palsy and the challenges they face and how we can change practice. 
So key milestones of the network is that we launched the CP toolkit in 2015. And to date, more than 5,500 copies have been distributed. We also released the well-being guides and the CP toolkit translations. I think it's translation translated into at least four or five languages in 2017. In 2020, um, my CP allowed and en en enabled um, the ability for us to personalize information in terms of blogs or other types of webinars or resources. And in terms of our research, this is our largest, most, um, the area where we put a lot of emphasis. We launched our clinical registry in March of 2016. And to date, we have over 7,500 people who have been seen in um, CP Research Network sites and their data has been entered. We launched our community registry, which is focused on folks in the community and really in the initiatives are focused on adult pain and well being um, surveys. That was in 2019. And we have 2008, 2008 people that are engaged with my CP in the community registry. We have a patient centered research agenda. For those of you who don't realize, the founder, Paul Gross, and Michelle Schusterman are both parents of children with cerebral palsy. And we have really engaged the adult community to push our research agenda forward. We have a significant funding um, milestone. We've had um, funding from NIH, from other private foundations, but we now partner with a very large private funder called the CP, the Cerebral Palsy um, Research Alliance. Um, we have five quality improvement initiatives as of 2020, and one of them is for adults with pain and pain screening across centers. We have nine publications, more than 27 academic presentations, and many manuscripts in um, preparation or under review. In terms of wellness, we partnered with NICPAD, which is at, the at Lake Shore at the University of Alabama, and it um, is a center for physical activity and disability and we provide the online mentor program. So the CP Research is a nonprofit organization and it's a collaboration of institutions, clinicians, therapists, researchers, and patient advocates. And we're really trying to improve the life and the practice patterns around the care of people with CP. There's a data coordinating center that is um, hired by the CP Research Network and it's at the University of um, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh Epidemiology Data Center. We have two registries. As I said, we have the clinical registry and the community registry, and we have education and well being programs. My CP is how you interface with the community registry, and it allows you to, it's a web portal that if you put in your information, you can get personalized information, recommendations, and communicate with other people who might have the same issues that you do. So like I said, we're really excited about our community registry surveys. And um, Julie is actually working off of um, one of our, our current projects. Just in terms of our registry snapshots, you can see this is our clinical registry and this is from 2020, uh, November 21. So we have more people, as I said, 7,500. But you can see we have sort of a U-shaped curve in terms of these are the categorization of the physical abilities of folks on a five point scale, where here are people, these two levels, people walk, you know, um, and even level three walk with assistive devices, where people in level four or five primarily use um, wheelchairs for locomotion. So you can see that we're heavily on, on either side and the middle isn't well represented. In terms of the age group in the clinical registry, you can see that we are predominantly um, pediatric, but however, there is a significant portion here, about 20% that are over the age of 18. And we're working to grow that. And I would imagine that that's even growing, especially with our adult QI initiatives. In the community registry, and this was as of February, you can see that we tend to have people that are more ambulatory, 
rather than the people that are use, primarily wheelchair users. Um, we're not really sure. We really want to reach out to people that are use wheelchairs. I think people that are more ambulatory might be having um, more experiencing changes and are very seeking information. And, and we need to work on that. We outreach to this, these groups of folks, how we can meet their needs for information and research. When we look at the age, however, you can see in the community registry, we have a substantial number of folks over the age of 18, quite a few of them. And then in fact, we have people all the way up to the age of 77. So here's our group. Here's um, Here are the folks that came together for community engagement to get the CP research agenda established. Here is the clin clinical researchers at the University of Michigan Botanical Gardens and a, a picture of one of our um, athletes. Here are our centers. The green dots are enrolling patients. You can see we're nationwide. Um, yellow, they're preparing agreements, getting um, things going. Red is looking at compliance issues and green are people that are approaching and trying to work on their application. And I think there were supposed to be some sites here that were circled with adult, excuse me, centers, but there's about five centers that see adults. And that would be at Michigan, um, Nationwide, Columbia, um, Colorado, um, and I think that's it at the moment. This is our study pipeline and you can see there's lots of studies. I wanna to bring to your attention that we do have one, two, three, you know, several, four studies that are very much focused on adult well-being and health, the consequence of falls. The green is our um, quality improvement. And you can see one of our quality improvement projects is the adult-centered QI. And we're ready to prepare that manuscript. We've presented it. And we're really um, happy with the results that we have gotten so far. So now I'm really excited. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to work with Julie. She's a clinical scientist. She's an assistant professor of physical therapy at Regis University. Her expertise is in neurorehabilitation. And she does research um, with a variety of methods, qualitative and quantitative. And she focuses on physical activity, behavior change, but her clinical practice is um, really focused on adults with cerebral palsy. So she's interested in low back pain in adults with CP. She's partnered with the CP Research Network and she's working with our team, with our adult study group members. She's recruiting from the registry and she's also going to be doing some secondary data analysis and qualitative interviews. So on that, I will just say, Welcome to Julie and thank you for coming. And I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you. Okay, and then I will start sharing, hopefully. Um, this. Okay. So you can see my screen and it's not uh, it's not my presenter view. Okay. I once gave like a really big presentation all in presenter view and nobody told me. So I like that you guys are verifying that that's not the case. Um, thank you, Dr. Janai. She is so wonderful to work with if you have not uh, met her before. Thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. You're a pleasure to work with as well. Um, so I'm so excited to be here today to present a study that we're going to start recruiting for very soon. Um, my title of my presentation is My Body is in Premature Aging, Exploring Chronic Low Back Pain in Adults with Cerebral Palsy. And this is a proposal. We haven't started collecting data yet. And what's really great about the timing of this is that we can actually get some feedback from you guys on some of the questions that we ask in our interviews. And that's a big part of why we're here today is to get your feedback. So 
so excited to have you. Um, and I know Dr. Sarmiento is uh, my also a co-investigator on the study. I think she's here. And uh, I would also Dr. Rich here at Regis is another co-investigator on this study. So, oh, and just so you know, um, if you're visually impaired, I am a white woman. I am wearing a light blue shirt and I have brown hair and a ponytail. So I want to tell you first a little bit about why I'm here and why I'm really interested in doing research on adults with cerebral palsy. So I've practiced physical therapy for about 10 years now. And one thing that I've noticed throughout my practice, which has been focused in adults with neurological conditions, is that while there is this mountain of literature surrounding how to optimize rehabilitation for children with cerebral palsy, there's really not as much in adults with cerebral palsy. And that is a, that is a problem. And so, but cerebral palsy and caring for adults with cerebral palsy as physical therapists is really embedded in the roots of our practice. So pictured here is Christy Brown. You might be familiar with his book or the movie, uh, My Left Foot. He actually learned to type and to paint with his left foot with the help of physical and occupational therapy. And so you can see that we have this um, history of working with adults with CP, but the literature is not really where I think it should be, um, given, the, given the need that these adults have, and particularly when it comes to chronic pain. And so I'm going to present um, a little bit of background on, on, on back pain and CP, and then a little more specifics on what we aim to do in partnership with CPRN. So we know that up to 70% of adults with CP experience chronic pain. So this is a very serious, very prevalent issue for adults with CP. We also know that it plays a major role in the functional decline that happens with aging and CP. It's one of the primary reasons that an adult with CP might lose an ability to walk that they used to have. Now, unfortunately, even though adults with CP might need care more than some of their typically developed peers who do not have CP and might have chronic pain, they're actually less likely to access treatment for it. And so we don't, but we don't really know a lot about why that is. And a little more background on low back pain and CP. It's the most common location to develop pain in individuals with CP. So that's what we're gonna focus on for our study. And potential causes of it could include, and potential biological causes could include deformity like a scoliosis, contracture, spasticity, dystonia, or spondylolysis, which is a stress fracture of the vertebra and the pars interarticularis part of the bone. Um, and this, but often these could be related to abnormal uh, gait or walking mechanics. Low back pain is definitely present in children with many children with cerebral palsy, but it tends to become more frequent as people age. And so there are treatments, even though adults with CP are less likely to seek treatment for their low back pain, there are treatments available. The first line of treatment in the general population for low back pain is uh, supposed to be physical therapy. Um, and then, so this is certainly an option for many adults with CP, although anecdotally, I've heard that many adults with CP are not, can't find the clinicians who are comfortable treating their condition uh, because of their comorbid CP. Um, but massage and exercise can certainly play a role as well as antispasmodic drugs. I've heard from a lot of patients that massage can actually be helpful. And in particular, light like effleurage type massage, not quite as much the deep cross friction massage tends to, be, tends to be helpful. And then also just things like yoga and heat and aquatic therapy, sometimes surgery can be indicated. And then equipment. So we, Sometimes if an individual tends to have a pain, have pain that's associated with walking, what I might recommend for that person is that they use powered mobility in the community, even if they can walk. And so sometimes we do need to make activity modifications in order to help people to manage their pain. And treatment satisfaction and research on this, this was done in 2003, so it's definitely not recent. But it has been shown that we have some room for improvement as far as how people are satisfied with their care. 
Um, so this survey study that was done a while ago showed that a third of their respondents, these were all adults with CP, were dissatisfied with pain care, while one third were satisfied. And the pain intensity correlated with treatment satisfaction. So the more satisfied they were with therapy, the less they had, the less pain that they had. And then there was another study that was done more recently, and this was a qualitative study that looked specifically at adults with CP and their experience seeking physical therapy treatment. Um, they identified that there weren't, people didn't feel like there are a lot of providers who were comfortable with treating their condition. And so this person said, nobody knows where to go. Nobody can say, maybe try them. I think everyone is winging it a wee bit. A wee bit, this is done in the UK. Um, it sort of feels a bit, yeah, just slightly messy. And I feel like things could be organized a lot better. And then so I'm also interested specifically in the construct of pain interference. So pain interference is a different concept than pain intensity. It captures how much pain actually interferes with day-to-day -day function. And the research on pain interference in adults with CP is really interesting because there's some studies that show really high levels of pain interference, the pain is getting in the way of people's lives and what they want to do. And some studies that actually show that pain interference might be lower in individuals with CP. And so there's obviously a very variable population and how much in adults with chronic pain and CP and how much chronic pain gets in the way of doing activities. We don't know a lot of why that is. Um, this picture here is a study that was done in 2021 that looked at how, how prevalent uh, pain interfered with activities and work or sleep. So you can see what's interesting here is that over half of the respondents or adults with CP and chronic pain actually showed that they that pain only interfered not at all or a little bit. But clearly there's a lot, um, th there, there were still a significant number of people who said that it interfered moderately, quite a bit, or extremely. So we don't really know why some people might not have a high level of pain interference. Are they more resilient? Have, have you lived with a disability for a longer period of time and have developed resilience to another health problem getting in the way? of functioning, or is it that there's a baseline low level of physical function? My personal hypothesis is it's more resilience, but I don't know. That's just, that, that might be a bias that I need to, to check with my research. Okay. So I also want to go over the uh, biopsychosocial model of pain because it's a really important framework for our study. So traditional models of pain have used tissue healing or sorry, tissue damage to explain pain and just these biological factors. I put here ones that I think would be specific to physical therapy, to, to cerebral palsy, uh, in particular accelerated aging. But the biopsychosocial model of pain also keeps into account psychological factors and socio-environmental factors that are contributing to the pain experience. And these could be things like a lack of expert clinicians or previous experience with the medical system or the presence of expert clinicians. Okay, so here's some of what we don't know. We don't know why adults with CP have high or low pain interference. We don't know why there are they, they seek treatment less than their peers with chronic pain, and we don't know why adults with CP are not satisfied with their pain care. So I am a qualitative and mixed methods researcher. So I think that one of the best ways that we can answer this is by asking people, by using interviews to gather this information and gather this data and use that to, to help to answer some of these questions. So I think it's important to define qualitative research. Qualitative research uses non-numeric data. So often these are transcripts from interviews or focus groups. For our study, they will be one-on-one -on -one interviews with individuals with CP. It considers the perspectives of individuals and their thoughts and their beliefs. So when you're looking at questions, looking for reasoning, motivation, behaviors, decision-making, and how past experiences can frame those decisions, then qualitative research is often a useful tool. So it's often used in exploratory studies where there's not a lot of quantitative research already done, and it can help to answer why questions. And then what you are probably already familiar with is quantitative research where we use numbers and measurements and data in order to produce statistics. So it's very numbers-based, whereas qualitative is very words-based. 
And then what mixed methods is, is when you bring qualitative and quantitative research together to strengthen findings and to answer really complex research questions. And so there's a saying in mixed methods that one plus one equals three. So qualitative research plus quantitative research, if it's mixed, it's more than the sum of its parts. And so the aims of this study are going to be to explore how attitudes, beliefs, and experiences with pain contribute to high or low pain interference in adults with CP, specifically those with chronic low back pain. And we also want to explore the experiences of adults with CP and chronic low back pain related to treatment seeking and treatment satisfaction for pain management. So I'll briefly go over our study design. Um, I'll try not to spend too much time on this, but we have already uh, participated in some quantitative data collection and analysis. So some of you have participated in the CPRN adult pain survey. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we really appreciate your participation in the survey. There's a lot of, there's been a lot more participation lately and we're really excited to have a, a very large data set that can answer a lot of really important questions. So we took a look at the first 150 people that completed their survey, and then we used that to characterize our study sample. And so there's this term in mixed methods called connecting. So our quantitative data analysis informs our qualitative data collection and some of the analysis as well. And so that's what we've already done. Um, we finished that uh, designing the qualitative study basically in April. And then here's what we are proposing to do. We want to learn how attitudes and beliefs and experiences shape high versus low pain interference. So we were able to use the quantitative data to define what high and low pain interference is so that we can, when we collect and analyze our qualitative data, divide people into those two groups. So we'll be doing one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews with 26 adults who have CP and low back pain. And then we'll do something called coding. So we'll go through our transcripts. We'll find all common codes and common things that people say to make themes. And then we'll merge our findings so that we can distinguish differences in people with um, higher low pain interference. And then we're actually going to be able to use the same data set to answer a second research question, which is how these biological, socio-environmental, and psychological factors can impact the low back pain treatment experience in adults with CP. And then so we can use the qualitative data to explore that a little further. So the recruitment strategy that I just want to kind of bring awareness to is that we're taking a subset of individuals in the adult CPRN pain study these will be people with various GMFCS levels. So Mary nicely highlighted in the beginning how we're trying to target wheelchair users or, and also people who don't use wheelchairs as frequently. And we also are targeting people specifically with high or low pain interference so we can make meaningful distinctions between the two. So they'll be identified by CPR and staff and then given information on how to participate. So because we're recruiting such a small sample, we have to be very specific about, about who we recruit. And so I'm gonna bring us back to the biopsychosocial model of pain because we actually do have some preliminary data on this. For those of you who've taken the study, you might remember that there were some open-ended questions uh, that were as a part of that study. And so we can kind of use that to look at what we might end up seeing and to demonstrate that visually for you right now. So when we look at the pain experience and we're considering specifically biological factors, people in the survey did identify that they, they felt like they were going through an accelerated aging process and that that was impacting their pain. So for example, somebody said, my body is in premature aging. I'm only 37, but my body feels 57. This was variable though, in terms of pain interference. Some people did say that their pain was getting worse over time, but that it wasn't impacting their activities quite as much. And so for example, this person said back pain has increased over the years. It's not very painful but usually present like an annoyance in the background that intensifies with long walks or exercise. So what we would be doing in this study is probing that further to ask the individual why they think their back pain does not impact their functioning quite so much and what the strategies they can use that they're using to, to manage their pain. And then what people also said is that there were some socio-environmental factors that could increase or could impact their pain treatment experience, particularly previous experience with the medical system. 
And so this individual said that they had corrective surgeries in 1971, which quadrupled the severity of my physical disability. Obviously, surgical practice, practices have improved vastly over the past 40 years, but clearly this previous, uh, some adults with CP who have gone through the medical system when surgery was not quite as advanced, we are still experiencing some significant disability that they perceive to be as a result of the surgery, although certainly adverse events can happen um, present day as well. Whereas some individuals might say that hardware, that surgery more recently has greatly decreased their pain. Okay, so what I would like to do now is I'm going to read out to you a few interview questions. I'll bring them all up together at the end so that we can discuss them. And I would love to get your to get your feedback on them. So I'll be um, taking some taking some notes. But we are interested in learning. And so this would be an opening question for our study, just to get a person to kind of talk and tell their own story. So this would just be to tell me, so be me being the researcher, about your experience with pain as a person with cerebral palsy. Uh, we'll have the results of their pain survey before we go into the interview. So we could remind them, remind the uh, respondent when their pain started, and then ask them how it presented and how it interferes with their day-to-day -day life. We also have a lot of questions for people about what they do to manage their pain, because we think that people with pain probably have some of the best ideas as to what to do about it. Um, so we're asking people how they manage their pain and why they feel like they're getting pain relief or not, uh, what worked well and what didn't work. We also have some questions surrounding the experience that people have had talking to their medical providers and clinicians and how that might impact their pain treatment experience. Uh, we also are interested in how pain changes over time. So we, people on the survey are already telling us if their pain is worse, better, or the same than it was a year ago. So we want to ask people why they think that is and how the experience has changed over time. We're interested in what CP symptoms specifically tend to impact pain and how, and then how factors outside of the body, such as support from others, can impact pain. Um, and then this is a question that I really love. If you have anything in the, and it's Mary's question, if you could have anything in the world to treat your pain, uh, what would it be? And so if we can take out some of these barriers and access issues that people would be able to identify, well, what would that be? That would be perhaps the, the best strategy to manage pain. Um, so before we get into the discussion and the q and A, I I would like to acknowledge Paul Gross. He's been incredibly supportive of this project. I don't kind of belong to CPR Insight, but he's still very helpful and supportive. And um, so I appreciate the, the partnership there, as well as the partnership with um, Maria Ginotti and Christina Sarmiento and Amy Rich, who's my um, colleague at Regis. And then also some funding we received from the Regis University Research and Scholarship Council Faculty Research Grant. That's a really long name. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you especially to people on um, the East Coast who are doing this webinar from eight to nine um, on Mountain Time. That seems really late to me. So I really appreciate your presence and your attention. Um, my references are here. And here I have the interview questions pulled up. So I'm happy to take questions from you or if you have some advice on how I could make this study better and make these questions better, I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. That's really wonderful. Very, very nice and clear. Um, and yeah, as Julie said, does anybody have any comments? Do they have any things that questions they think we should ask? Do you think this is valuable? Um, Julie, this is Debbie Thor from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if, if, you know, one of the questions you might ask a little bit more specifically to say, describe your pain to me. Mm -hmm. Because people with cerebral palsy really describe their pain differently. Um, I know my kids, you know, say that they, their, their hamstrings hurt or whatever, but that's more muscle pain. 
um, as opposed to bone pain. I can see Morgan shaking her head and Heather. So maybe a question that basically says, describe your pain to me before you say, tell me about your experience with pain, describe your pain to me. No, great. Yeah. Wrote that down. That's a really good idea. Thank you, Debbie. I have um, a couple of comments. Sure, go ahead. Um, regarding your question about um, why don't adults with CP seek treatment as much as their peers, I would speculate um, it's not only from previous medical um, interactions, but also um, we don't register pain the same way. It's a, um, I also think it's, it's, it's because we're so used to living with some level of pain that, 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 that we just don't seek it out as quickly because, because the, either your tolerance is really high or it's, it's low is what I've noticed. There's, there's not a good modulation of in between. And I've noticed as I've gotten older, it, my tolerance is lower, but it was a lot higher when I was um, younger. If I could comment and piggyback, Amber, can anybody hear me? Uh -huh. sure. um, so my suggestion would be, um, Debbie mentioned like bone pain and you know um, muscle pain, those things are different. Um, maybe even tantamount to, or in equivalence with saying that I would have people maybe grade their pain because like you might have bone pain and also have horrific contractures. Um, and you might just have like so much fatigue that sometimes, you know, if somebody asks me that and you know, my eyes roll back in my head and I go, are you serious? Like if I answer that question, the appointment's gonna be over because I mean, just going through my history kills a doctor's time. So I think, you know, I've gotten in a stage where one of my providers, I message her office staff with my list of things. Um, I need to do that uh, for my great rehab doctors. But my PCP, I just send notes. Today, I'm going to deal with this, and this is how it's been this week. And that way, she gets to read it all and everything. But if I have to do it one by one, the other thing is I would ask those questions if you're doing surveys and research based on age, what surgical procedure you've had, and how long it's been since you think you've had effective access or actual physical therapy. Great, yeah, that's good. That's good feedback. Um, anecdotally, as a clinician, I often hear that people don't get PT for a very long time after they age out of the pediatric system and they kind of get um, cut off. And I think that is part of the picture. So thank you for bringing that up. I know we have a, a couple of hands up. Um, so Heather, I think you had your hand up. What was your feedback? It was similar to what's already being discussed is put in some questions around types of pain because we experience multiple types of pain as has already been addressed. But I know as I'm aging, if I ever get to tell my doctors what my pain is like, which is very rare, um, they, they, their eyes kind of glaze over. So mm. <laughs> um, it, there's a disconnect. So you need to understand that we're dealing with multiple types of pain. And so what treats one type of pain will not treat another. Um, and we don't have a lot of access to um, things that relieve pain. Or we're not given a lot of access to them, let's put it that way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the one word that I keep saying is pain, but pain is very, it's subjective, but there's also very concrete um, differences between bone pain, nerve pain, muscle pain, that kind of thing. And we deal with all of it, all wrapped in a lovely package. Um, so yeah, that's my feedback. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's really good feedback. And I agree that pain can come from many different sources. And so it's good to be able to, to tease that out. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, Morgan, you had your hand up next. Yeah, so for me, I wanted to just comment on the portion of where individuals here had said like past medical experiences as well have been bad. Um, a lot of the reason why I am as healthy as I am right now is because they were choices and decisions that I made on my own behalf to go back to the gym four times a week to receive um, massage therapy through um, different programs that I'm a part of to do heat and all that kind of thing. It wasn't necessarily practitioners and it wasn't a physical therapist because the last couple times I had seen one, it wasn't the greatest experience. So I think, I don't know about everybody else, but I kind of feel like my success has come from me actually advocating for myself and asking for what I needed, but then you end up going through your adult life doing things for yourself instead mm -hmm. of really actually receiving the support you need from a physical therapist or from your gen prac. I mean, I know I have a really great orthopedic surgeon, but I feel like a lot of different people with their access to care, it's not the same. And it's a choice that I had to do for myself. It wasn't that everybody was like in agreement for my care plan. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that. And if I could ask you a follow-up question, um, this, I, I'm really interested in, in this because you said that you did go back and you did try physical therapy again. So what was it about the physical therapy that was not a great experience? I think um, a majority of what I've been told over the course of my life, um, I know it's different now because I've seen the results for, you know, using alternative medicine like massage and acupuncture and all of those things along with exercise with personal trainers who I had to tell my, tell my story and have them with their expertise be able to say like, this is what we can help you with. I think for me, my past experience, one of my physical therapists when I was in high school, I was about 14 and it, they just kind of were like, you just have to stretch every day. And that might be true, but think about it. A 14 year old going, one, you've got hormones, two, you're in school, you're trying to like take sciences. Like I live in New York state, so we have to take, you know, like regents and those big exams and everything. So for me, it was like, you do the physical therapy, you do the aqua therapy, you do all the therapies, but the patient themselves, like the whole person wasn't being addressed when I was a teenager. So it made my adult life a lot more challenging to find the resources and find clinicians that were willing to work with me. And I've had some, but then it's like, even with your, you know, like your orthopedic surgeon, like those people age out of practice, you have to find a new hospital, find a new doctor, like decide that you're happy with, you know, your course of treatment. But every couple of years that changes or like different PTs, like just your personalities, like things change. And as an adult, it had to come from me again to say that I knew that I was going to have to do this for the rest of my life. So it had to come from my own psyche to be like, okay, I can get up every day and devote like the hour, two hours or however many appointments I wanna book out to take care of myself for myself. But as a young adult from like 14 to 21, I don't think kids have access to that between, you know, like conversations with their parents and their doctors. Cause like someone else had mentioned, you know, like your gen prac kind of just glazes over the situation because they're your general care provider. So it's a little bit of that, I would say, that you have to treat the whole person. And I've never, no offense to anyone, but I've never found a physical therapist that really like 100% vibed the whole time because they were so focused on treatment as opposed to like 
the person they were treating while they were helping them get better. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate yeah. that feedback. In the comment, they the there was about, um, are we asking what type of CP they have? And absolutely, that's information yes. that we have about um, the folks that have participated. So I don't know if you want to call in someone else, Julie. I don't know who was next. It was De um, is Dina yep. or Duncan. Who, who is Julie, do you know who's next? Here, um, I think, I'm sorry. I, I don't know who had their hand up first. Um, so we'll go alphabetically. So Dina, go ahead. You're still muted. Thank you. You've got a question on there about how um, how you're managing your pain. Uh, I'd be really curious to also hear about what different um, potential modalities for managing pain have been suggested or um, offered by um, healthcare professionals. Okay. And yeah. potentially as a follow-up to that, if there were any barriers to accessing those uh, modalities for pain management. Okay, yeah, that's a great suggestion. Uh, can I, I'm sorry. I think we have Duncan and then Susan and then Amber and then you could go Chris. Thanks. Duncan, do you wanna go ahead and? Yes, yeah, some uh, quick observations as a uh, kind of a elder of a tribe, I'm age 77. <laughs> I can tell you that over seven decades of interaction with primary care physicians who have absolutely no training with cerebral palsy, one does get to the point of uh, simply not seeking any help because we've been told over and over again, oh, that's just part of your cerebral palsy. And now I get, well, it's part of your cerebral palsy and you're getting old. Yeah. So <laughs> just live with it. So unless you've been successfully navigated the system and find the expertise like yourself, Julie and, and Mary, uh, you get discouraged about helping for uh, intervention on pain. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you. Whenever I visit a primary care physician, the intake nurse will always ask, do you have pain today? And is it one to 10? And then that's the last that subject comes up. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they bother to ask the question. <laughs> because they certainly don't plan to do anything about it. Mm. Uh, and then my final observation is, um, I, would, I would say, and you, you touched on it, Julie, with the psychosocial issues. During my life, when I have felt more engaged, and having greater social psychological satisfaction uh, with my life, um, I manage pain much better or see that pain as less intrusive. Uh, but I can tell you that as I've aged out, and not been as socially, civically engaged in the community, I do tend to focus or perseverate more about the pain than I did in the past. Thank you. That's really great. It's really great feedback. I appreciate your perspective as our, our the, the elder of the tribe is. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Yeah. All right. So now we have Susan and then Amber. Um, I'm not sure. Hi there. I'm not sure I'm on camera, but it's okay, right? You're um, on perfect. Oh, okay. Um I had had uh I'm in a wheelchair all day and I was having some butt pain and it was uncomfortable, but it didn't seem that bad. 
And then I finally asked the physiatrist about it. And he said, let's do some x-rays. And it turned out that I had um, a L4 vertebra crack from osteoporosis. And I say to myself, how could I, I mean, I think I have, it's like, I can tell you something hurts a lot and I can also almost completely ignore it. Somehow I can pretend it's not happening and it's fine. So I, I, I don't know what to tell you about uh, the experience of pain of people with CP. And to me, it seems like a switch that I can turn on and off. Um, and uh, that's, that's the situation. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. All right, Amber. Yeah, I think um, it's, well, several things. First of all, I think it's the biggest gap for adults from my perspective as um, a person with CP and as a clinician is the lack of transitional services. And until we can bridge that gap, I don't see things getting um, significantly better. I mean, I think that has to occur. And I know it is, but it's still a very small um, percentage. Um, and then, you know, not everybody has access to that or is, or is even aware that there is access for the limited transitional services that are available to adults. Secondly, I think the other thing um, that, that you may wanna take into consideration in your study is that people with cerebral palsy, as you I'm sure aware, have major sensory distortions. Yep. So I think that's why yep. there's such a variation in the experience of pain. And that may also be true in the non-CP po uh, population. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm assuming there would be some similarities as well, but because of the, the varied sensory distortions, um, I think that's a, a key piece to as why you have low and high interference and why there's such an extreme it's like all or none and it's about finding the middle and being able to understand the middle i mean from my perspective and That's a great observation the the pain perception and the pain processing is most likely different in people with cerebral palsy because the pathways are different the brain structure is a little different so it's a great right problem. right and then i think um to go back to, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember who was speaking about PT. Um, I think PT, OT speech, all clinicians, we need to be very conscientious with our hands when we're working with children with CP because you grow up to be adults with CP and mm -hmm. Um, we also need to be conscientious with our words. And um, I, I think that, and, and, and what we, our treatment um, goals as far as, you know, always looking at the future. Like I always tell my parents, don't ever, um, can, you know, don't ever cancel a birthday party for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I'm not as important as the social aspect mm -hmm. of something. And the other thing is um, to answer your question, uh, if you could have anything in the world to treat your pain, what would it be? I've found that water therapy, hippotherapy, and massage therapy have been um the best modalities for that that have been not in addition to PT and other traditional therapies, because um, I don't want to discredit <laughs> them. I think it's just all knowing when and how and, and why. And, um, you know, but if I could have massage every single day, that would be great. 
Yes, excellent. Thank you, Amber. We have Chris is going to go and then um, John, and then it might be time to wrap up. But these are awesome, awesome insights. Go ahead, Chris. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through your questions point by point. Um, you mentioned that you had whatever percentage of pain in the last 24 hours. Why do you think that is? I would tell you that 80% uh, of my pain is because spasticity never lets up. It doesn't matter about tizanidine, flexoril, baclofen. By the time you are aging, you feel like you're in a constant, you know, marathon where you just don't get the muscle relaxation. Massage above all, I've hired a physical therapist who works on his own. And if someone does massage and knows that well, or if you use, um, I've used like doTERRA oils, things like that, and had my caregiver help me with that. Um, just the experience of unwinding and then using it with like music. If I didn't use 20 years of um, counseling uh, so that I could frame what was going on with me, I think I'd go crazy. So I think we should have sleep and mental health be requirements of physicians for people as they go through life. Um, I don't like to be very personal, but one of the issues that I have found in talking to a lot of people is there are things that happen to children or with children when they're preverbal. So I'm having a contracture. My cerebral palsy causes me pain. It's too hard to get on the school bus. Well, your brain learns the neurology of those things. So as you age and you once again become dependent, needing help, where you might have overcome some of that, those um, neural memories of what it's like to struggle more than before or struggle less. If you succeed at something, you're gonna wanna succeed more. If you're trying and trying and getting, you know, up against the wall of not enough help or, you know, it's cost so much money for 500 MRIs. Well, that's where I would say if we switch things and we said, you know what, I'm great at navigating things. My husband might be great and he has a regular back surgery. There's nothing wrong with him. But if you put a third party advocate in the picture with the person so that they're being taken seriously from someone else, then they're not just viewed as patients. And I think maybe appointments with advocates with them that maybe aren't even just family members, but that's where you hook them into case management. I don't think that we should go through life and lack case management. It should be a lifetime psychosocial thing to have a partner in your CP journey. Excellent, Chris, really nice. All right, John, I really appreciate your thoughts. Those are wonderful, Chris. Yes. Well, um, I'm sort of like Duncan in that I'm one of the elder individuals <laughs> in this group at 71. And I agree with him that I've run into so many situations where physicians just do not have experience and understanding with cerebral palsy. And it feels like you're hitting a wall sometimes to get people to know what's going on. But I'm wondering, have people run into barriers towards getting treatment for, for pain with cerebral palsy? I mean, I've been trying for a few years now to get uh, physical therapy, maintenance therapy under Medicare, and I cannot get through the Health and Human Services log jam. Mm. Uh, they, want, they will not move me to maintenance therapy. They keep me in rehabilitative therapy, and they can't. And basically, I'm considered to be rehabilitated for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other problem that you have, I go to a chiropractor, but by law, a chiropractor, when it moves from rehabilitative to maintenance therapy, is no longer covered. Mm -hmm. right. Fortunately, my chiropractor is good to me, and he charges me a lot, rather low office visit fee, but quite honestly, it's all out of pocket. <laughs> Yeah, that's unfortunate. You know, with Medicare and reimbursement for maintenance therapy, it's, it's, an, it's interesting. They won't, if they think that a qualified caregiver can provide the same level of care as the physical therapist, it's or him or her or their self can. So yeah, that's an interesting, um, it's an interesting conundrum. I'm sorry to hear that, that you're, that you're experiencing that. 
I mean, essentially the, the plan under, you know, health and human services is that they're going to move you to home therapy okay. with a non-qualified practitioner, one of, a family member, something of that nature. Yeah. Okay. Well, as you to everyone, I want to respect everyone's time. And I am so excited about the, all the engagement. It sounds like that these questions are, um, you know, they gave some good input to the questions, how to maybe um, get some more information. You gave some great insight. Um, there were questions on if we're just focusing on low back pain. The hope is by focusing on low back pain, you know, we might be able to really come up with this cluster of treatments that people really like. And it, it you're, what you're saying is resonating with what we've already found in the registry. So we'll have two data points to talk about massage and, and, and the, the, the hydrotherapy and so forth. Um, so that's really wonderful. There was an, also a comment about looking at people's past medical history, and we will definitely be asking people about as much information as possible because I'm pretty sure I forgot the, the name of it was Sarah or Sandy was talking about um, a pain in her back that actually happened to be a fracture. And yeah. that is an issue. Um, it's complicated with bone health. Yes. So I don't know, Julie, if you got enough information, but I feel really excited if there's anything else you want to say to the group before we wrap up for the evening. No, I just want to say thank you everyone so much for being here and for sharing your stories and helping to guide my study. I think this is, I think it's going to be really interesting when we get results of results of this and for to hear from lots of people's stories. So I just appreciate your honesty and your openness and your, and your help with moving this research forward. It means a tremendous amount to us. Well, thank you, everybody, and I'm going to end for the night, and the recording will be available um, in a few days. So thanks again for your attendance. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.